everyone, if you're watching it on Twitch live or if you're watching this on YouTube, welcome back for part number two. Um, so, like we talked about databases a little bit, like what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, um, and one of the nice things is that you can also use databases in R directly. Um, so one of the packages that I've used in the past to directly um, make a database on my own hard drive and to use it um, is our SQL Lite. So uh, SQL Lite is one of the most commonly used databases, especially in app development on mobile phones, um, because it's a very lightweight SQL database. Um, and of course, if you want to get an overview of all of the commands which are supported, then you can just go to SQLite language. There's the description of the language, because like I told you guys, every SQL engine has their own little dialect um, and SQLite is a limited version of SQL. So you can do a lot of things, um, but they're not, not all of the things that like big databases provide, um, like professional databases where you have to pay for. Um, and it's a free database engine. Um, so you can install it, of course, by just using the install the packages function um, and then just say our SQLite and this will install it into R for you. So the way that this works is you just have to create a database driver. So in R, you can issue the following command saying make a driver, um, use SQLite as my database driver. Um, and you can also connect to other databases. So it's not just for SQLite because instead of writing down SQLite, you can also write MySQL or Oracle or ProgressQL. Um, so you can use this, this um this database connector to not just connect to SQLite, but also to all kinds of other databases. After you've connected to a driver, um, you have to create a connection. So the nice thing is in R, you can actually also connect to a data frame, right? So just to a single table that you have loaded in R. So if you want to connect to a data frame in R and then do SQL queries on that data frame, um, you can just say DB connect, use my driver and then give it the data frame name. Right? So the data frame name is the name of the variable that holds your big matrix. Um, and then hey, using the connection, you can start querying. You can also um, connect to, for example, an existing database on your hard drive. Um, so what you do then is say um, system.file um, in the folder data, um, there's a database called database underscore name um, and then you connect to the DB file which is just the file on your hard drive and this is this is really useful um, and why is this useful because we can now use SQL in R right so we can do things like create insert into select from update and delete Right, so it gives us these commands um, to work. So if you're, if, if there's a lot of uh, information and examples in the SQL Lite package. I don't want to go through all of them, um, but here uh, there's a direct link. So just go to the PDF and um, click the link, and then you get an overview and examples on how you can query um, your data frame or how you can query SQL Lite databases directly from R. So why do you want to use our SQL Lite? It avoids some of the complex R commands that you use for selection and merging of different tables, right? Because um, I can say select from table A the entries where the foreign key constraint of table B is larger than 16, right? So there's there's it avoids a lot of this complexity where when you're trying to merge two databases or two data frames or two matrices into one in R that's a little bit cumbersome because you have to make sure that the row names of the first one are matching the row names of the second one or you have to kind of make this selection yourself um, but the nice thing is if you know SQL hey you can avoid some of this complexity by just using SQL commands a Another advantage is that memory is managed much better, right? We don't have to have the full data set in memory. Imagine that I have a data set which contains six gigs of information. Then loading in this file into R will use up most of the memory that you have available in R. And that is one of the drawbacks because like I told you guys in the R lecture, um, R is very poor in memory management everything is in random access memory so that limits you to the amount of random access memory that you have in your computer. 
by using RSQLite you can actually connect to a database which is hundreds of terabytes big if you have a hard drive which is that big of course um, but then you can query that and R will only load into memory the, the results of your query Right. If you so, if you if you imagine a massive table with millions and millions of entries um, and and hundreds of columns, right? Then by saying no, I want to have from my data set only the animals which are older than 10 weeks and which have a weight below 50 grams. Then it will only pull out that subset of data from the hard drive and then bring bring that into R to make it available. So the database driver is very smart in handling memory um, and hey, because you are generally only working with subsets of your data, um, it, it is just better to just not load the whole thing and have to wait half an hour for the thing to load into R. Um, and it is also much faster. So our SQLite is, is optimized for doing commands on big, big data sets. Um, so hey, if you, if you do a query where you say, um, select from this table these things where these columns contain these values, um, then this is much quicker doing it using RSQL than it is using standard R commands. <coughs> So searching a database, of course, there's many ways that you can search through a database. Um, you can do it text-based, sequence-based, motif-based, structure-based, mass-based, if you're talking about uh, mass spectrometry, right? So, but you always have to remember when you select the database, do they provide a bulk data download or do they provide an API? So the list of important databases, um, I think everyone knows PubMed. So PubMed is the standard database for scientific literature. Um, so, and it's run by NCBI. So it's called NCBI PubMed and this contains more or less all of, <coughs> um, I'm sorry, this contains literally all of the literature that has been published in the last like 25, 30 years. So if you're interested in um, or if you want to do a query and say, give me all the papers about um, microRNAs in cows that have been published in the last five years, um, then PubMed is your place to go. Um, Ensemble, we saw hundreds of times already during the lectures, and this is a DNA database. Um, we also have GenBank, also a DNA database. Um, the DDBGA, also a DNA database. Um, for proteins, we have four main databases. So we have Uniprot, Tremble, Peer, and PDB. I think we already looked at PDB, and I think we also looked at Uniprot. Um, Tremble we will discuss in a later slide, but that all of these databases are protein databases and contain information about protein and protein structure. Um, so here hey, you can, for example, search for a certain motif um, and say, well, give me all the proteins which have a DNA binding motif. Um, we have the NDB, which is the nucleotide database, which is for nucleic acids. So those are um, databases which um, contain kind of, it's a mix between DNA, RNA, microRNAs, and these kinds of things. There are, of course, many, 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 many other databases, like we have ProSite and PayFam when we're interested in protein families or when we're interested in protein uh, motifs. Um, we have CAG and Reactome, which we already discussed in a previous lecture. And we have DBSNP, which is the database which contains single nucleotide polymorphism data. Um, we have DBEST for um, expressed sequence tags. Um, we have the OMIM database, uh, the online Mendelian inheritance in men. We also have the OMIA database, so the online Mendelian inheritance in animals. So these two databases contain information on Mendelian traits in humans and in animals. And if you're interested in QTLs, um, because we also talked about the QTL, um, we already did the QTL lecture, I think. Yeah, we did. Um, and if you are interested in which QTLs have been published in the last 12 years in cows, um, then you can go to the animal QTL database. So the animal QTL database stores information on who found a certain association with a genetic region? Um, have, how strong was this association? Does the association increase or decrease your phenotype? Um, and it does this for all different animal species. So it doesn't matter if you're interested in mouse or goats or, um, or cows or 
lizards, um, there's bound to be uh, a, a, a species, or your species is bound to be in the animal QTL database. So PubMed, like I told you guys, it contains scientific literature, um, like uh, we see here. So if we just search for PubMed in Google, then you get to the main site, which looks like this. Um, you can select here different databases because NCBI doesn't only have the PubMed database, it also has databases like uh, Nucleotide Core, um, which contains all of the core nucleotide sequences, um, and it also contains protein databases. But PubMed is the most up-to-date scientific database. So an overview of NCBI is, of course, it, it's kind of the starting point for biological knowledge and information. Yeah, so um, yeah, Ensemble is, is one of these NCBI data. Um, no, Ensemble is from um, EMBL. So NCBI is the National Center for Bioinformatics. Um, so they run PubMed, so the scientific literature, um, but they have also a lot of different databases. Um, so hey, you can, if you're interested in things like DNA and RNA, or if you're interested in genomes and genetic maps, or if you're interested in proteins or homology between different proteins, um, then NCBI can help you there. Um, it has a lot of built-in tools as well. So if you want to do local sequence alignment, it, it has a built-in BLAST function, um, but it can also cluster data for you. And the nice thing is, is that it has a very good automated data retrieval system. Um, so and you can connect to the database from R directly and then, then download the stuff that you want into R um, by using the NCBI connector. NCBI is an, an NTRES database. So we have Ensemble, and in Ensemble, every gene has an Ensemble gene ID. So that is their way of coupling all the data to this gene, right? So they their primary key in Ensemble is the Ensemble ID. In NCBI, everything works with NTRES IDs. So um, they have the same gene has an Ensemble gene ID, but it also has an NTRES ID. So the nice thing about all of the databases at NCBI is that you can query them all at once. Um, so let me let me show you guys this. Um, can I just? Um, no, I can't click it. So let me open up my Firefox window for you guys, and then just go G query um, NCBI. And then the. All right. So if I want to know, um, let me just close this thing because we're not really interested in the COVID thing. Um, but hey, you can see here that it has like the literature database, and if you scroll down, then it has genes and proteins and BLAST and and all kinds of. Uh, it also has chemicals in there. Um, but the nice thing is, is about. Uh, hey, that's not what I want. Did they rename it to search? I thought it was always called jQuery. They, they yeah. yeah, so it defaults to search. So they changed the URL. And we'll have to update that in the thing. But if I want to know something about, um, well, BBS7, favorite gene of interest, right? So we can just say search. And then here it will show you all of the databases, right? And in each of these databases, it shows you the number of hits. So you can see that in, in the bookshelf, which are books, um, there are 34 books which deal with BBS7. Um, well, not just BBS7, but books where BBS7 occurs. Um, hey, you can look into PubMed, you can look into PubMed Central, right? So you see that there's uh, like 560 papers being published about BBS7 as a gene. Um, there are 525 entries in the gene database. There are 1,200 or around 1,100 entries in the protein database. And there's also things like clinical trials. It also occurs into OMIM. Um, so it, it gives you one place to search for everything, right? And you can you can you can search for anything that you want. So you could search for Google as well, um, which of course, occurs in scientific literature, um, but there's no gene called Google, right? So, but this is really useful. And so if you want to know something about 
a certain gene and for example you have to write your master project and your master project is about obesity right just go to um, the search uh, to the g query search um, and then hit just throw the gene that you are researching in here um, and then you can see what is known um, had the genomes like bio projects and bio samples mean that there's sequencing data available of this gene uh, short read archive is uh, a, an archive which contains like um, the whole genome or not whole genome but it contains um, short read sequencing um, so it's a it's a really interesting um, search function and it, it allows you to very quickly get up to date with all of the different features and um, all of the different literature and things which are available for your gene. So G it's, it used to be called jQuery, it's now called just search, so that's nice. So the nice thing is, is that when you search you can use boolean operators like and and or and not, right, and you can use parentages to change the priority. So for example, if I'm interested in DGAT1, which is one of these genes controlling milk yield in cattle, um, and I want to then have papers or uh, publications where uh, DGAT1 is mentioned, but also it has to mention Bos taurus or Bos indicus, but none of the other Bos species. So this is the kind of European cow and this is kind of the Indian cow. Um, so you can you can build up these very complex queries um, and get a lot of information from it. Um, it defaults to all fields but they also have a query builder where you can build your own uh, queries. Right? So if we want to for example have a range um, we can search by date or molecular weight or the length of the sequence. And so in theory if we wanted to know everything being published between January 2008 and, and um, November 2011 and then we can say well give me all of the information about DGAT1 in Bos Taurus, so only one of the two and in this publication date range and here we can then specify that this is the publication date. So if I'm looking for a very specific paper and I know that this paper was published somewhere early 2000s and I know the last name of the author um, and I know kind of the gene that they're talking about then this will allow you to very quickly find back papers that you are looking for. Um, Hey, it uh, has popular search limits, um, there are different special cases like you can use author names or database IDs. Um, one of the nice things is, is that you can actually use wildcards and query truncation. Um, so a wildcard is using a star. And so for example I want to know everything about DGAT1 and BOSS star. Um, so that selects all of the BOSS taurus, BOSS indicus um, and, and BOSS musculus organisms and these kinds of things. Right, so you can use um, all of these. So and there's a, a, a really nice um, overview. So on their website, they actually list all of the different things that you can search by. So things like publication date or organism or gene name. It understands that you're then searching for a gene or for a certain organism and you won't be spammed with all kinds of search results which are not really useful. The nice thing about NCBI is, is that it also contains a, a download section. Um, so hey, if you if you want to download, for example, a complete data set, um, then you can just go to the home page and then you can say uh, download slash FTP. Um, so hey, you can directly go to the FTP server and download the whole database and use it locally instead of having to do queries and build up your own Excel file. So and of course this is this is important for a database. So Ensemble, we already talked a lot about Ensemble, so we'll just quickly go through it. So it's there for comparative genomics, it, have, it allows you to look into evolution, sequence variation, how transcripts are regulated. And so Ensemble annotates genes, computes multiple alignments, it predicts regulatory function and collects disease data. Um, different tools are BLAST and BLOT and Biomart. Um, the Variant Effect Predictor is a very important database. It's a it, um, hot coffee 955. Thank you for following. Um, so the Variant Effect Predictor is a very interesting uh, tool and you give it a single nucleotide polymorphism 
and then it will tell you if this single nucleotide polymorphism is modifying an amino acid in a protein or if it's not, if it's located in a regulatory region. Um, so the variant effect predictor is a very, very useful tool if you want to drill down like which single nucleotide polymorphism might be causal for my phenotype. And of course it provides integration with many external databases. Hi, Hot Coffee 955. Welcome, welcome to the lecture. Um, thanks for following as well directly. That's cool. So Ensemble is also the home of the ENCODE project. So I already told you guys that after the Human Genome Project, the ENCODE project is kind of the big next step in human genetics. Um, because with just the sequence, you don't know anything. Right? You just know the, the order in which the A, C, T's and G's occur in, in a certain genome. Um, but the ENCODE project is a, a big project, a multi-billion dollar project with many different universities participating. And what they did is they built a comprehensive list of functional elements located into the human genome. Um, is there, uh, there is a Linux distribution. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are many different Linux distributions. Well, not just for bioinformatics, but also for, for other tools. Um, yeah, they, they provide tools so that you can just run it into a virtual virtual machine or you can run it on a, on a cluster. So the nice thing about the, the Ensemble, the ENCODE project, is that they provide a lot of data for free. Right, so it has produced genome-wide data for over a hundred different cell types and they, they are very they are they try to annotate this sequence right the sequence itself doesn't really teach you anything it is just data it's not knowledge and the encode project is there to provide the knowledge right so what they did is they looked at things like chromatin structure like um, is chromatin open in this cell type or is it closed and if you know that chromatin is closed then you know that all of the genes in this region are not being transcribed anymore Right, so um, if you know that um, a certain gene that you're interested in is expressed in, in a certain amount of tissues um, and you then see, yeah, okay, there's a, there's a chromatin structure nearby or a chromatin modifier like a histone, um, then hey, you can kind of start reasoning about, okay, so it might be this histone binding the DNA, curling up the DNA around it, making the gene inaccessible for transcription. So they have histone modifications, they have DNA binding motifs of over 100 different transcription factors, and they also provide a lot of free RNA transcription data. So how highly is your gene expressed in a certain tissue? Um, and they did that using RNA second cage. Um, so the ENCODE project, it lives at Ensemble. Um, so if you are interested in regulation of genes or the expression of genes and how it's different between different types of tissue, um, then do take a look. One of the databases that I use a lot um, and I talk about a lot as well is the dbSNP. So it is the single nucleotide polymorphism database um, and it is for humans. Um, it used to be not only humans, it used to be that dbSNP would accept any species, um, but since like four years um, they said like no this is this is too much information, so we just want to focus purely on humans. Um, so only single nucleotide polymorphisms in humans. And so they contain not the single nucleotide polymorphisms, but also microsatellites, small insertions, small deletions. Um, they provide the publication um, which found the single nucleotide polymorphism, um, but they also give you things like the frequency inside of a population, right? So if you're interested in a, in a certain SNP, is it more common in Asian people or is it more common in European people? Um, then dbSNP can tell you that. Um, and of course, they, they have other information as well. Um, and they have information about common variants and, and clinical mutations, which is really nice if you are interested in certain diseases um, and if there are SNPs known to cause uh, variations in, in clinical diseases. So if you look a little bit closer in dbSNP, then they have two types of IDs. So their database is more or less split into two, right? So they have primary keys for SSIDs and they have primary keys for RSIDs. 
So when you submit your information to dbSNP, you get a, an SSID for your mutation that you found. And this is called a submitted SNP. Once they have reviewed the data and make sh made sure that the SNP is really true, so have once other people have found it, then this SSIDs are being transformed into RSIDs. So this means a reference SNP. So that means that the SNP is real, that it has been seen by multiple people or has been sequenced by multiple people. Um, and like I told you guys, since 2018, um, all other species are not stored in dbSNP anymore, um, but they are taken over by the European Variation Archive. So if you, if you want dbSNP for cows, then you go to the EVA, so the European Variation Archive. Um, and then EVA does all species besides humans. So for humans, you have dbSNP. For cows, goats, you have EVA. So the PDB, we already talked about it, I think, in a previous lecture. Um, so PDB is the protein database. It contains information about different protein structure, different function. And the nice thing is it provides three different visualizers. So if you want to look at protein structure, um, then you can use the NGL, um, the YASMOL, and the PV um, um, uh, viewers. Um, so the PV viewer is kind of the newest one. It uses uh, WebGL and modern web browsers. Um, so generally the PV viewer is the one that, that, that is the, the default currently, I think. Um, but there's other ways of visualizing. And each of these, they have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, but just be aware that PDB is the database for protein information and protein structure. And you can view these structures even online on your mobile phone and, and look at how for example, certain mutations might change uh, the structure of a protein. So protein databases also provide, or PDB also provides sequence and structure alignments. Yeah, so you can do pairwise sequence alignments like BLAST2SEC or Needleman Wunsch and Smith Waterman ally uh, pairwise alignments. Um, but you can also do structure alignments. So structure alignments means that you're not looking at the, or you're not aligning a amino acid sequence to a similar amino acid sequence, they are looking at structure. So as long as the shape of the protein or the part of the protein that you're interested in is matching your query, um, then it will give you um, results. They also look at things like protein symmetry. So if you want to know if a protein is symmetrical and how many symmetric axes it has, um, and this can be important in some cases. Um, and the nice thing is, is that it also provides the quality measurements of the protein structure. So it will tell you how good a protein structure has been determined. Um, so, hey, is it, is it uh, reliable up to five Armstrongs or is it reliable up to 10 Armstrongs? Um, that's something that PDB will tell you. So the, the protein sequence, uh, one of the other protein sequence databases is Uniprot. Um, so Uniprot is a very big database and it's divided into two different databases. So it's actually a combination of two. Um, so the arrows, I point them down, but they should actually point up because both Swissprot and Tremble kind of feed into the Uniprot uh, knowledge base. Um, so the Uniprot is one of these other protein databases which contains protein information. Um, so if we look at the Uniprot uh, database, then it has manually annotated and reviewed records, right? So this is one part of the database, so the Swissprot part. So the Swissport part is a manually annotated database, which means that all of the data from this database is very high quality. Um, if there's something in there, you know for certain that it's true because a professional or an expert in the field looked at the data. Um, so when I looked at the database last time in 2019, there were around um, 560,000 uh, proteins located into this database, which is not a lot, right? Because we know that a human has 20,000 genes. Every gene produces around five different proteins. Um, so that would mean that a standard human has somewhere between like 100,000 to 200,000 proteins. But of course, there's many different species. So having 600,000 protein entries is kind of having the whole human proteome for five different species. 
Um, it is updated every month and again it has many tools which are integrated so you can use them directly from the website or you can just download the data. Um, and, but you can see the growth in the database so you see that there's a lot of annotation being added from 2005 to like 2010 and it's not growing that quickly anymore. The, um, the other part, right, so the other is the tremble. So because human curation is very expensive, because you have to pay people to look at the data, it's a full-time job going through these databases and manually curating the errors that are in there, um, they also have the Tremble. So Tremble uses the coding sequence and then translates this into protein sequence. So it takes the big kind of genomes that are out there then looks to see if it can find a start codon and then starts saying well okay so I found the start codon and then I'm just going to make a protein sequence from this um, kind of piece of DNA right so it is computer annotated which means that it is not reviewed it's also monthly updated um, and in 2019 you can see that it has almost 180 million sequences and this is the big difference between databases that are human curated and which are computer annotated. I told you guys in the beginning that I would show you a, a, an example of where computer annotation can go completely wrong and that is, that, that is exactly what happened at the start of 2015 because people figured out that the algorithm that was used to do this CDS translation to protein sequence was not entirely correct. Um, this is due to the fact that we, I've shown you guys this amino acid wheel and then I told you guys be aware that the universal genetic code is not as universal as you think. The same thing is what happened to Tremble. So they assumed that the genetic code uh, was like the same for every species in their database which actually led them to massively like over kind of produce proteins um, because that by, by, by doing this translation they just did not look into kind of specific details for specific animals right so a start codon is uh, coded as a methionine um, but this methionine can be coded differently in different species um, so they, they were just using kind of the human annotation so the the, the algorithm based on on what we know from humans and then they were also using the same code to uh, to annotate extremophiles leading to a massive amount of wrong database or a wrong protein sequences in their database which they then had to kind of correct um, so that's what you see here very clearly is that at a certain point they had to go into the database and manually delete almost half of the data in there because the half of the data in there was complete nonsense because it was a prediction by the computer but the computer just predicted it wrongly and this is why if you if you write papers always try to use databases which are human curated good um, that's difficult it's 242 and I was actually hoping to have all of the stuff in the first hour and then do this in the second hour but we were already like 40 minutes into the second hour it's always the difficult part about getting back after holidays is you always overestimate the speed at which you do things um, I think I'm just going to continue for 15 minutes I think I can get through it and then we will in the third hour have um, you guys watching me do my goat analysis um, and I use Biomart. So Biomart, um, I told you guys that I'm really, really excited about this tool. Um, it's one of these tools that in bioinformatics you can't really do without. Um, so the nice thing about Biomart is that if I need my data in R, right, I can do three things. I can manually search through databases and create an Excel file. Um, let me show you guys an example of where I did that actually uh, so um, since since I'm a little bit like out of schedule anyway so when the pandemic started in beginning of 2020 right I was very interested in COVID so I did the thing that I do as a bioinformatician so I started looking through the ensemble database to see what was known about coronaviruses. Um, so I created, um, let me see where it is. Um, where are you? 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 Um, uh, let me see. I 
XL, XL, XL. That's not the one that I wanted to show you guys. Blah, blah, blah. That's the registrations for the R course in the summer semester. That's also not. Um, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Looking at the OneDrive. Huh. Where, 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 where? Ah, there it is. XLS. Um, COVID-19. All right, so let me add a window capture. I have to open it up then. All right, loading, loading, loading. All right. And make it a little bit smaller and then add a window capture. All right. This. Good. All right. So, right, because as a bioinformatician, um, when something like a, a pandemic happens, um, then of course you, um, you, you want to know more about it, right? So, the first thing that I started doing was just make a big sheet. Right, so I just went through the database and I searched just for coronavirus, right? And then um, what I was interested in is was trying to figure out um, if it is a naturally occurring virus or if the rumors that were online going around saying that it's made in a lab and it contains part of HIV and it's gonna kill us all, if that was, was true, right? Um, so the first thing that I did is in already December 2020, I think. Yeah, so the first December, no, December 20, 2019. So the first time that I heard of the virus, I already started scouring through the Ensemble database to see all of the different coronaviruses which were out there. And of course you can, you can do this, right? But you can see that this data is relatively incomplete. But at that point in time, um, there were around a hundred and sixty-one sequenced coronaviruses. Um, so I just went through the database and I just made my little Excel file saying that, well, this is a name, short name. This is the species in which they found it, the country in which it was found, the year, the type, the subgenus, um, because there's many different types of coronaviruses, um, and then the origin. So where did it come from or where is it located or who did the sequencing um, is there any publication that's attached to it um, and then what is the genome right so this is just the um, identifier for the genome and then I loaded in this thing in, in, in R and then downloaded all of the all of the genomes automatically using Biomart but I could have saved myself all of this trouble right because one of the things, if you're doing stuff in Excel, Excel will kind of screw you over, right? Because if I write um, OCT1, right, uh, which is a very well-known gene, or um, OCT1, um, then it will do this, right? So it will turn it into 1st of October. So there are a lot of publications out there that talk about the gene 1st of October, while well, the gene is actually called OCT1. So Excel is, is not the perfect tool for gathering data. Um, so just as an example, so, but this took a lot of work, right? So it's, if you, if you search through the database, click on the links, um, create your own Excel file, it is, it, it is manual slave labor in a way. So it, it like just collecting all of this data took me a couple of days of, of clicking and copy pasting. Um, and it's very error prone. So I had to go through the list again, make sure that everything matched because sometimes you would copy paste something in and it would change the format. So one of the other ways of doing this is just make sure that the database that you're searching through actually is, has an FTP download or an SFTP download so that you can just download, bulk download all of the data that you want. Then there's less chance for errors. Um, and the, the big issue here is, is that different different servers might have different data formats. So instead of having one script which can load in all types of different data, you have to write like adapters which make sure that the data that you downloaded is put into the same format so you can compare between different databases. The next thing that you can do is use Biomart. 
And Biomart is awesome because it retrieves data, data directly into R and there's no chance for errors. Um, you don't have to deal with different data formats because you can specify the data format that you want and, and Biomart will just give that data to you in the format that you specify, which is really, really useful. So. What is Biomart? Well, it's a community-driven project to provide unified access to distributed research data to facilitate the scientific discovery process. So, and it's not just for Ensemble, because I often say like, oh, you connect to Ensemble, but you can also connect to almost all biologically relevant databases. So Biomart also allows you to search through PubMed to download literature and do literature research. And it's not just for R, for the R programming language, but you can also use it from Perl, from Python, um, you can use it in SOAP and REST and XML, um, but many of the big programming languages actually provide a Biomart package for you guys. So, hey, it's not just R, you can also, if you're a Perl programmer, you can also use Biomart. If you're a Python programmer, you can also use it. Um, so, Biomart is a very interesting tool and it, it, it does the way that it does so well because it has very simple concepts. So it has a concept of Mart, like a super Mart, um, and, and that is the information provider, right? So Ensemble is a Mart, NCBI is a Mart, um, KEG is a Mart, um, Reactome is a Mart. So what a Mart does, so what it does, it's that a Mart provides things which are called data sets. So these are kind of tables, not really tables, because they can span multiple tables, um, but data sets are something which a MART provides. Then we have something which is called attributes, and those are the information columns that we want to retrieve from the data set, right? So this data set might span like a hundred different tables, and all of these different columns are columns which you can query. So if you look at the attributes, those are the things that we want, right? But of course, to retrieve data, we also have to tell the data provider, so we have to tell the MART, what are we going to give you? So those are called filters. So a filter is something that you provide to allow the database to understand what you want. So a filter can be Ensemble Gene ID, right? Then I'm saying to the database, I am going to give you Ensemble Gene IDs. But you, a filter can also be an Entres ID or a genomic location. Um, and like there's literally hundreds of filters, but the attributes and the filters and the data sets are unique to every MART. So Ensemble provides different data sets than NCBI and CAG also provide different data sets from NCBI, but the filters are also different, right? So Ensemble might allow you to filter based on Ensemble Gene ID, uh, while NCBI might allow you to filter based on Entres ID because they just use a different ID. And then it has things like values, and the value concept is the things that we are querying for. So, so I can say, um, from the data set mouse, give me the attribute, which is, for example, we want to know the chromosome and the position of a certain gene. The filter is the ensemble gene ID, and then the value is the ensemble gene ID of the gene that I'm interested in. All right, so let's do a very quick example. Um, I hope that we can run through it and like, ah, we can we can make the lecture a little bit longer instead of doing a break exactly after an hour. So let's say that we want to investigate mouse chromosome three from 15 to 45 megabases, right? So we want to know certain things, like we want to know where, um, we want to know something about genes, of course, and so we want to know the location of the genes, we want to know the number of exons, and for example, the number of functional SNPs, so SNPs which are located in the, um, in the, in the exons of the genes that are located in this region. So how do we do this? Well, we start by creating a new script, and as always, when we create a new script, um, we make a new header. Right, so we, we write down and we say, well, this is the analysis of mouse chromosome three. Um, I give a copyright statement, so I mentioned that I made it and that I'm working for the HAU Berlin and that this is the group that I'm working for. When was it first written? When was it last modified? Right, this is information that's just to keep my, or to remind yourself in like 10 years why you made this script. We start by loading the Biomart library, of course. We have to install it also in R, so 
that's just an install that packages. Um, but after we've installed it, we can just make the library active. And then my scripts generally start by using a set working directory to where I have stored my data. But in this case, we're not using this, but we just have to, we have to go somewhere on the hard drive. All right, so and now we need to connect to a Mart. So let's first connect to Ensemble. So if I loaded the Biomart library, then I have this useMart function, which allows me to connect to a data provider. So I'm just saying uh, connect to Ensemble and then store the connection into something called Mart. Then we can use the list data sets to see which, what the data set is, which data sets are provided by this Mart, right? Because initially I have no idea how Ensemble calls their mouse data set. Um, we can also search via pattern, right? So we can also say search data sets, um, Mart is Mart, pattern is, and then search for mouse or homo sapien or whatever you want to search for, right? This is just a pattern. You can use wildcards as well. So you can also say uh, M O star, then it will give you back all of the data sets where there's an M and O and then anything behind it. Right, and of course, the nice thing about Biomart is that we also want our research to be reproducible, right? Because the ensemble, crap, see, it did it again. It did it again. I hate when it does this. Where is this slide? Where is this slide? Here, let's delete the E. Like, ah, it's so horrible. The autocorrect always screws me over with ensemble. So the ensemble database is continuously updating, right? And like I told you guys, I made my sheet for SARS like two years back almost. Well, two years back at, at, at the moment. But of course the database has been updated many, many times. Um, so if I want to retrieve data now and I want to redo my analysis, then I have to um, go to one of the archives. And hey, if I, if I, if I, there's a function called list ensemble archives, which will go back in time. Right, so in this case, you can go back all the way to 2009 um, and do the analysis as if it were 2009. And this is really, really useful um, because hey, it allows for reproducible research, which we want to do. Um, so hey, when you use Biomart, connect to the Biomart, but make sure that you know which version you are currently using and then write this version down inside of your script as a comment saying that this script is using ensemble version uh, 103, which means February 2001, uh, 2021. Right, so, um, but if we then do the, the list data sets, right, so instead of looking at the archives, if we list the data sets which are available in Ensemble, we get this massive, massive list of literally like, I think it's almost a thousand different species, right? So it, it allows us to say, well, I want to connect to Gallus gene ensemble, which are the chicken genes, or I want to um, go to M domestica gene, which is the opossum genes, right? So it, it, it allows you to select which data set you want to work on. When we then want to query, um, we can use uh, the get biomart function, right? So we have the use mart, connect to a data provider, list data sets to show you which data sets are there, but then I have to can use the uh, get biomart function to retrieve my data. And if I want to retrieve my data, I have to specify my attributes, I have to specify my filters, and I have to specify my values, and I also have to give it the mart connection object. So we can also retrieve sequences. We don't have to retrieve genes and gene IDs, but have we can, for example, use the get sequence function to retrieve any type of sequence. So we can retrieve DNA and protein sequences in R directly from Ensemble as well. Um, so for example, if we want to retrieve cDNA sequences of the genes on chromosome one in mouse between one MB and six MB, we can do something like this. We say library biomart, we use mart ensemble, we use the mus musculus gene ensemble, which we got from this big list here, and where we looked at all of the different data sets that are available. And then I can just say get sequence chromosome one from uh, one megabase to six megabase. The type is the annotation in this case, give me the ensemble gene ID, give me the cDNA, and then use the biomart that we use. And if I want to get the peptide sequences, I can just say sec type is peptide. So 
Back to the example, right? Because we want to know something about mice. We want to know something about chromosome 3. We want to know about the genes which are located between uh, 10 megabases or 15 megabases. Which was it? Um, 15 megabases to 45 megabase. So let's go and do that, right? So again, we have to connect to the mouse database. So we say use Mart ensemble mus musculus gene ensemble, and we store this connection to the Mart. And then we know, of course, need to know which attributes and filters are available because every Mart provides its own filters and provides its own attribute. So we have the list attributes. Um, and we have the list filters function, which we can call on the connection object. Um, and this will give us a long list of all of the filters and all of the attributes that are available. So generally when I do this, um, because there are thousands of attributes available in Ensemble, I generally only show the first 20 um, to see if it's in the top, right? Because the, the most used attributes are returned first by the function. They don't provide you the they don't put it in like an alphabetical order, they put it in the order of most used. So generally if you want something, it's generally in the first like 20 or 50. So you can just say list attributes of this mart and then subset the matrix taking the first 20 rows. You could also take the first 50 rows, but then you can kind of look to see what's there. If you know what you want, you can also search uh, again. So there's also a search attribute function um, which allows you to just input a search term. Right, so ensemble gene ID might be a search term that you might want to search for. It might be one of these attributes that you want to retrieve or chromosome, right? And then there's probably something like chromosome position or chromosome start or chromosome end. Um, yeah, but if you do the list attributes, uh, then it looks like this. And of course, there's a list filters as well to retrieve the filters. So if we list the first 10 attributes, then you can see that the things that we can retrieve from the database are things like the ensemble gene ID, the transcript, the peptide, the exon, the description, the chromosome name, start position, end position, the strand, um, the band, which we never actually talked about, and it's not that important. We can also list the filters, right? So what can I use to to what can I give the database which it understands? This is what can I get from the database and list filters means what can I give the database? What will it understand? So in this case, it will understand things like chromosome name, start, end, band start, band end, marker start, um, and but also chromosomal region, right? So, but in this case, like the example, we want to get all of the genes located on chromosome 3 from 15 megabases to 45 megabases. So in this case, the chromosomal region is the filter that we want to use, right? Because we want to get all of the genes in a region. So we want to say that the attribute that we want to retrieve is the ensemble gene ID, right? Because we want to know which genes are there. And the filter that we're going to use is chromosomal region. So we define our filter, right? So the value that will go into our filter is, is the region that we're interested in. So it's chromosome three from 15 uh, megabases to 45 megabases on the positive strand. Um, and we, we want to retrieve the gene ID. So I say that my attributes are the ensemble gene IDs. Those are the ones that I want. So this is my value. This is my attribute. And of course, I also have to specify my filter. Um, so I can now say get Biomart, get the attributes that I requested, which is just the ensemble gene ID, use this filter, and then the values are the region that I inputted. I can do this for multiple regions in, in one go. So I'm just, just specifying one region now, but if I make a, a C and then comma, I can add like 10, 20, 40, 100 regions and, and retrieve them all in one go. So this is what I do, say get Biomart, do the call, and then I get back a list or a matrix which contains the data that I asked for. And then when I look at the number of rows, um, then um, it tells me that there are 211 genes in the positive direction on the DNA in our region, right? So that's, that's the list that we get. So we, we actually want to have more info, right? We don't just want to have the ensemble gene ID. That's very limited because then we don't know where the gene starts and where it ends. Um, but so in this case, we might want to also have the gene name, which for mouse is called the MGI symbol. Um, we might want to have the description of the gene, 
uh, the chromosome name, the start position and the end position. So I'm just instead of going to retrieve one attribute, I'm now just going to retrieve multiple attributes. Nothing changes into the call. I just update my variable, call biomart again, give it the new give it the new attributes, give or give it the, the same attribute or give it the new attributes that I want to retrieve, give it the filter and give it the values as well as the mart that I want to search in. Um, and of course then when I look I get back something which looks like this. Right, so it tells me that at 24 megabases um, there is a, a gene called GM24704 and this is a predicted gene and that's what GM stands for. And then we also have microRNAs which are not really genes um, so of course we might want to focus a little bit right because we, we don't really care about the microRNAs or the predicted genes. We might care about them, but imagine that we only cared about protein coding genes, then we can also do that, right? So we can we can then, um, if, if I was only um, interested in, in protein coding genes, and then there's two options at this point. Um, we can add the biotype as a column and filter ourselves, because the biotype will tell me if it's a microRNA, if it's a protein coding gene, if it's a long non-coding RNA, and these kinds of things. Or number two, we can eh, we can filter in R ourselves, which is not really the goal because we are using a database, so we want the database to do this for us. And we want to go into all of the data that's there and just get a subset out. Um, so hey, we make our filters more complex um, and we only retrieve the data that we need. Um, so make Biomart do the gene biotype filtering for us. So in this case, we're going to define a new filter, right? So I'm just going to update my filter. So instead of chromosomal region, I'm also going to give a biotype. Then we have to define our values, right? Because the my region didn't change, right? So I'm still interested in the same region, but now I have to make a list, right? Because I can have two filters, but I could also have like five filters or 10 filters but I can retrieve multiple regions as well. So I need to use a list in this case because my region is a vector, could be a vector, uh, the same for biotype. Biotype could be a vector as well. I could be interested in protein coding genes and microRNAs. Um, so what I do is I, I specify my new filter. This is just a vector, but in R I have to make a list saying that, well, this is my region. I, in this case, we only have one um, and I want to have protein coding. So the first entry of the list refers to the chromosomal region. The second entry uh, refers to the biotype. So again, we query saying that, well, give them, give them the attributes, the filter that we want, and then the values. And then we end up with um, a new gene IDs, right? Or gene ID list. Um, and then hey, how many protein coding genes are in our region? Well, there's only 58. So that's kind of what I wanted to know because I'm interested in the number of protein coding genes. Um, although I might be interested in the number of microRNAs as well. But this is how we can use Biomart to kind of um, use the computers of someone else, right? Because my computer is not doing anything. It's just doing a query and I'm only getting back the data that I'm interested in. So we started off by retrieving like 210 something entries um, and now we're only retrieving 58 entries which is really good because then it's quicker and it's better for R as well. In the next step of course we want to do things like retrieve exons and also here Biomart can do this for us it can it can retrieve a list of all of the exons and also the SNPs inside of the exons. So in this case, we can just use a for loop and go through the different genes one by one, um, use the ensemble gene ID as the filter, and then query per gene this information that we want. Um, for example, retrieve the exons per gene and their start and stop location. Right, so I'm going to define a new filter. Um, no, I'm going to define a new attribute, which is called gene attributes. So for each of the genes in the resulting data set, so for all 58 genes that I have, I want to get back the ensemble gene ID, the exon ID, where does the exon start and where does the exon end? And then I just use a, a for loop, right? So I take my original results that I got from Biomart and I say for gene in the column ensemble gene ID in this matrix, what do I want? Well, I just want to, again, use a get biomart function and I say get biomart, get the gene attributes. So for each 
um, gene get the uh, ensemble gene ID, the exon ID, the exon chromosome start and the exon chromosome end and then hey, in this case I'm not going to use any of this I'm just going to cut it out to the screen so when I run this I, s I see that well this gene here has 13 exons the next gene has 16 exons the next gene has 8 and so on and so on right so I can I can repeatedly use calls to Biomart um, to just get the information that I want Good. And then the final question, of course, the SNPs. So find the single nucleotide polymorphisms located into these exons. Um, they are unfortunately in another mart. They are not in the ensemble mart. They are actually in the DB SNP mart. So here we have to connect to a different database to retrieve the SNP. And so we have to we have to now create a new connection to a different data provider. And in this case, we would use the uh, ensemble mart SNP um, and mus musculus SNPs because Ensemble provides the interface for EVA uh, and because dbSNP only is for humans um, but since kind of it's, uh, it's, it, it's the EVA. But anyway, this is kind of the way that you would build up these kinds of queries and where you would kind of download the data that you need and um, look into it. Good, so again, when I connect to the SNP marked, I can list the attributes, I can list the filters um, yeah, so there's no filter in this case for ensemble gene ID, um, so I need to use the exon start and end position. So I need to query all of the SNPs using chromosomal region, use the Biomart filters and supply the exon start and end position. And then we could do more filtering based on the consequence or the SIFT score. Um, but this is the exercise for today, for the, for the assignments. Good, so I went a little bit over time. Um, well, not over time because I only took two hours of the whole four hour lecture. Um, but I told you about databases, right? Like why do we use databases? Because they are more efficient. They provide like checks on our data. They can warn us when we're trying to input data, which we shouldn't input. Um, I told you about database organization, that you can have databases in different normal forms and that this depends on how fine grained your data is kind of is, is pulled out of each other, right? The, the granularity of the data. Uh, I told you about different features, different types of databases, and some of the important databases that are out there. Um, and some examples, like we quickly looked again at um, NCBI and, and, and these kinds of things. And furthermore, I told you about Biomart, and I gave you a very small and short example, um, which we will continue doing after the break. So after the break, I will work on my abstract for, well, not my abstract, but from a colleague of mine um, who is very interested in uh, African goats. Um, so I will just show you guys what I've been doing in the last two to three days since I'm back from holiday um, to kind of figure out, um, figure out or get an idea if we can use goats from Africa to learn something about milk yield and about meat production of these goats. Um, so that's going to just be a little bit freehand, um, but I think it's important that you guys, well, it's not important that you guys watch me work because that's a little bit strange, but it's it's a nice example because I've, I'm at this point where I have to use Biomart myself for retrieving uh, genes from regions that we defined or that we found to be interesting for meat and milk production. Um, so I just want to show you guys how I use Biomart on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there will be part three of the lecture, um, but for like information on the exam, um, this is more or less the end of the lecture. So um, if you think that you don't want to see me watch or if you're thinking like, ah, oh, like screw that, I can figure out the Biomart thing myself. Uh, I'm just going to sit myself behind the computer and do some like Biomart hacking, um, then that's fine. Um, so I will upload the um, assignments to Moodle again and also to my website so you can get them there. Um, but for now, um, are there any questions? Um, and if not, then we, we do a short break. Um, so, but for the people on, on watching it later on YouTube, I will say um, goodbye and see you in the next video.